What are the fundamental steps to flipping your first property? In today's video, I'm gonna give you the answer. I feel like I've overcomplicated YouTube a little bit. I don't know if people have noticed, I upload a lot less regularly than I used to. Um, I think I've just been overthinking the, the way I'm doing it, trying to make it super high energy, super engaging. But I'm gonna go back to my roots, go back to the simple me to you, pure value, pure information. Let's get going. Step number one is get a job. Now, a lot of people are gonna click straight off this video, but just before you do, it's just the reality. It's just the straight up fact. You need an income to be able to uh, get into property. And there's a couple of reasons for that. It doesn't have to be a job. You could be self-employed with um, a proof of income, or again, you could be a business owner. You just have to prove that you have income. The easiest way to do that is employed. But if you are self-employed or you are um, a business owner, as I say, there is a way of proving that you have income uh, and also just getting income. The, the reason why I say that is two reasons really. The first is that uh, if you have income coming in, you can live, you can actually survive. Don't go quitting your job with no other source of income. Stay in your job or stay self-employed, whatever it is, in order to keep that income coming in. It allows you to save up money and it also allows you to borrow money. Banks just look at it like risk. Is this person risky enough or should I say safe enough to, for us to give them our money? Um, are they going to pay us back? And to prove that you can, it's called affordability. It's about how much you can afford, how much you can borrow from a bank where they feel confident that you will be able to pay it back. So some form of income is absolutely essential. Step number two is, it follows along from that, you need to find out how much it is that you can borrow. So you might know, okay, well, um, I make 50,000 pounds a year. Usually it's four and a half times your uh, salary. Whether it's, um, if you're buying it with two people, then it's your combined salary. If it's just one person, it's just your individual salary. So you've got to work out, but it's roughly, usually, four and a half times your um, annual salary. So if you earn 50,000 pounds, you should be able to borrow 225,000 pounds. I'm just gonna prove myself right there and make sure I've not got that wrong. So good at maths. 225,000 pounds. Using this information, you need to move on to step number three, which is find your perfect location. Now for me, location doesn't really matter. Um, you know, proof of property selling is good enough for me. But this is your personal preference. Based on your budget, what you can afford, if you can only afford 150,000 pounds, then your, your areas that you need to look into will be limited. Um, if you're based in London, all you can afford is 200 grand, you're gonna be very, very tight for cash. You're probably not gonna be able to buy anything, so you need to start looking in other areas. What is your location, your prime location? Where are you going to focus your energy and focus your efforts uh, when it comes to finding the right property? Uh, before you can find the right property, number three, find the right area. But as I say, for me, location doesn't really matter, um, and I'll explain why, because if you buy a house in Doncaster, and every single house on that street is a three bedroom terrace, and they all sell for 100,000 um, pounds. If I buy that house, if I buy a house on that street that's a three bed terrace, and I buy it for 70,000 pounds, I don't really need to worry about losing money because you know whether it's a nice area or not, everything's selling for 100 grand. So if I put it for 70, I should be able to make money. It's gonna be very difficult for me to lose money on that deal. Similarly, if there was a place in London where things were selling for a million pound, every single property on the street sold for a million pound, and then I got something for 600, 700,000 pounds, it's gonna be difficult for me to lose money. As I say, for me it's a numbers game because it's about flipping houses. For you, if you're flipping a house that you want to live in as well, you kind of have to throw that into the mix as well. So it's really personal preference. It's a mixture, personal preference, but also your budget, what can you afford? Sometimes you need to compromise and mix the two, compromise on them both in order to be able to afford something that will actually make money. But that is step number three, find your area. Just before we move on to the next step, I'd just like to ask for you to take 3.4 seconds out of your day to make sure that you hit the subscribe button and the bell notification. It means that you won't miss an upload and it also makes me feel better. Um, I find my validation in my subscriber count, so um, the more people that are subscribed, the more I feel better about myself. So we'd really appreciate it. It would be great to have you part of the community, part of the family here. Um, hit the subscribe button, like the video if you like the video, and also comment any questions 
questions because I want to start communicating a little bit more and helping people individually. So if you have any questions, comment them below and on to the next point. Step number four is get your deposit together. Whether this is saving up cash, whether you've inherited something, whether this is building a business that brings you enough income to save a big pot of capital, whether it's remortgaging your personal home, uh, whatever it might be, you've got to get that deposit together. If you are going to be buying a residential, you need at least 10% deposit. If you're going to be buying it on a buy-to-let mortgage or you're going to be buying it on a bridging loan, you need 25 to 30%. Um, but also if you're going to be buying a cash You'll need the whole lot. Whether you make that money yourself or you raise that capital yourself, it's up to you. But you need to get the money together in order to be able to afford to buy the house. Step number five is find the house. And I'm gonna just reel off a bunch of ways that you can do that. There's so many videos out there about how to find a flip deal, how to find a property deal. I've probably done a couple myself. So I'm just gonna reel off a bunch of different ways that you can get uh, property deals. So I'm just gonna read them out because it's just easier. I've written them down. Right move, Zoopla, on the market, letters, leaflets, door knocking, networking events, Google ads, Facebook ads, Google ads again, <laughs> don't know why I've written that twice, TikTok ads, YouTube ads, deal sources, auctions, friends and family. There's just a few ways that you can find deals, but they're all great ways. Step number six is start viewing houses. Uh, get out there, start you know meeting those vendors, meeting those um, agents, get to know them, building that good relationship with them. When you start finding things that might work, just get out there, just get viewing because it's so much easier to secure a deal when you've seen it, when you've built a bit of rapport, um, it's easier to uh, negotiate in person, all that stuff. So start viewing houses. You want to be able to uh, estimate the refurb as well at this stage within the nearest few thousand pounds. It's not absolutely vital that it's bang on uh, because we'll be getting a quote from a builder later on down the line, but to be able to estimate it um, would be really helpful. I wouldn't worry too much about the refurb costs. Again, if you can get a rough estimate, then it really helps. Um, but if you are buying a house, let's use that example that I said before, three bed terrorists, a big row of three bed terrorists on a street in Doncaster, they've all sold for 100,000 pounds or more. If you can secure that in a similar condition for 80,000 pounds, worst case scenario, the worst case scenario is you just sell it again and you sell it for 90, 95, give someone else a little bit of a discount, but it means that you get the property off your books, you get it um, so you're not paying out the bills, the mortgage, whatever it might be. That's just worst case scenario. Some people do that. For me personally, I do that a lot at the moment. I'm rarely seeing opportunities where renovating a house actually adds enough value to make it worth it. So actually, at this stage, you could even just be thinking, I'm gonna be buying it at a discount and then selling it straight on. The refurb costs aren't always as essential, but if they are, if you are 100% sure that you're gonna renovate it, then being able to estimate it is really, really helpful, but we'll be getting a quote later down the line. Step number seven is do your due diligence. This is where your calculations come into place. Um, before you put forward an offer, you need to make sure that you know what properties are selling for, what um, you will be able to sell this one for. There's a few different things that I would recommend, so I'll just throw those out to you now. Uh, it should be easier for you to, to work out, but it's my kind of guide that I use to work out how much I'm going to offer. And it's all about starting with the end in mind and working your way backwards. So the first stage to this is working out what your end value is. This is both when you are, whether you want to renovate it, um, but also if you don't want to renovate it as well, what is the uh, max end value that you're gonna be able to sell this for in both scenarios, whether it's renovated or not. Then you've gotta work out how much it's gonna cost you to renovate. As I say, estimate it, ballpark figure it at that stage. Um, you know, if you're gonna be 10 grand out, then maybe get a builder and bring a builder along. But um, if you're gonna be just a, a thousand or 2,000 pounds out, then just throw an estimate out there, work out what it's gonna to cost to renovate. And then it's about making two calculations. The first is working out what the end value is, subtracting what the renovation cost is, and then subtracting what kind of profit margin you'd like to make. And that is what you can offer if you're gonna be renovating the house. The next one is work out what your end value is if you didn't renovate the house, then take off your profit margin that you want to make, and then that again is what you can offer on the house. And what's good about working that out is it gives you the best case scenario and actually what is best for you in each situation for you to maximize the amount of money that you're gonna make on each deal. So just to really simplify this and make it really, really basic for you, let's say you've got a 250,000 pound 
end value once you've renovated a house. It's then going to cost you £25,000 to get it to that £250,000 uh, sale value. Um, and you also want to make £25,000 profit. So looking at that, obviously, this is very, very rough numbers because you've also got to factor in other, other costs as well. I understand that. But let's just say those two costs are there and you've got to then work out, okay, that means that my offer needs to be £200,000. Now, let's just say that you aren't going to renovate the property, but you know that you could actually resell it for £230,000. Again, you want to make £25,000 profit. So you take that off of that end value. So therefore, it means that you can offer £205,000. Now, what you've also got to factor in is if you renovate it, it's going to take you more time and hassle and effort um, to actually renovate it. So it's also working out what you'd cost that as. Uh, but for me personally, in today's market, I find that it's very, very often easier to just buy and sell straight away. Leave the renovations to other people. Um, it's just not always worth it in, in today's market. It's just bonkers. A house that needs... £20,000 work on it will go for probably just about £20,000 less than what the end value would be anyway. So it's very, very rare that it's actually worth to, uh, renovating a property in the current market from the point of me filming this video. Then once you have worked out what is most profitable for you, which route is most profitable, you therefore have the offer that you are happy to put forward. So step number eight is submit your offer. This is done to the vendor or to the agent that's involved, depending on the type of property deal that it is. But I would always go in just a little bit below what you're happy to um, agree at, just so that you've got a bit of room to negotiate a little bit higher if you need to. Step number nine is that the offer gets accepted and you instruct your solicitors. Your solicitors will basically hold your hand through the whole process, if they're any good, if that's what they should do. Um, explain everything, explain what the next steps are, and take you through that whole conveyancing process. They really do a lot of it, so they just send out the paperwork. You've just got to make sure that you read it, sign it, send it back, and push that through as quickly as you can. But really, the next step is just that whole conveyancing process. How quickly that happens is 100% down to how good your solicitors are. Um, our solicitors are incredible. I am blown away with my, how quick my solicitors move. Uh, but I also work with solicitors that are super, super slow. So just make sure that you've got a good solicitor on side. Step number 10, let's say you've just completed on the property, uh, then I would be getting a tradesman in as soon as possible uh, or a main contractor to quote up all of the work, make sure that you've got a schedule of works there, you know how long it's going to take, you know what it's going to cost, you've got a contract in place with your builder um, and that everything is properly lined up. Step number 11 is start refurbing your house. This is the really exciting bit where you get to uh, get in there, rip the whole house out, put in exactly what you love, what you like, put in the nice kitchens, the nice bathroom, and make it look incredible. This is the transformation bit. Um, but make sure that you, whether that's you know with your personal trades or whether it's with the main contractor, make sure you're using people that you trust. Um, that you've seen the work that they've done before and that you know that they're very, very good. In terms of the refurb process, people have done loads of videos on this. I think I've done a video or two on this before. I'm not 100% sure. But what I thought I'd do is just break it down into really, really simple steps for you to know exactly what you need to do um, in terms of the order of a renovation project. Thought it might be easy. Throw it in there. Bit of value. See how you see how. If you like it, use it. If you don't bin it off and use your own builder. So firstly is rip out. The cost you've got to factor in here is labour and the skip cost. This is ripping out your kitchen, your bathroom, your uh, carpets, your wallpaper, whatever it might be uh, that you want to pull off and get out and remove from the property. That gets done in this rip out process. Then the next step is remedial work. So whether this is fixing some damp issues, uh, replacing some old floorboards, um, filling in some cracks or dealing with any subsidence, anything like that to fix up the property that happens after the rip out and before anything else takes place. Next is to first fix plumbing and electrics. Then you plaster the house, whether that's the whole house or just certain parts that need it. Then you put in your new windows and your UPVC doors if that is something that you want to replace. Then you want to be fitting your skirting and architrave. Fit your kitchen, your bathroom, 
your uh, second fix plumbing and electrics, put the internal doors in, paint the whole house, put the flooring down, then any kind of snagging work to finish off. Now, that is a super broad stroke, um, <laughs> quick run through of a basic renovation back to brick um, kind of not even schedule of works, just the kind of works that you get done. For some properties, you go into a little bit more, well, a lot more detail, um, but that is just a quick fire. That's the kind of order that we usually go in when we are renovating properties. Really simple, obviously every house is different. You have some setbacks. Um, you might have to get someone in to do the archetype before you fit the kitchen, but it's, it's not like that's absolutely essential to do in certain ways, but, um, that's just, for me, the ideal breakdown for when things get done. Now, once the property's been fully renovated, it goes on to step number 12, which is get it on the market, get it sold. Now, the thing with this is I've made the mistake before of paying up front for an estate agent. Um, it did not go well. We spent nine months with it on the market, and then we took it off the agent. We tried to sell it ourselves and sold it within 24 hours. So. I wouldn't pay people up front, they've got no incentive to then go and sell the property. I often go down the route of um, would, you know, just a fixed percentage because that incentivizes the agents to get the most amount of money possible. Um, use a company like HomeSpot. Um, I run an estate agency called HomeSpot, um, online estate agency. We're based in Manchester, cover the whole of England and Wales, um, and it's a banging service if I do say so myself. Absolutely incredible. I'm so proud of the team and what we're doing and what we've built. So if you're interested in selling your house, let me know. But that is it, is getting it onto the market and getting it sold. And the next thing that you need to do is obviously just subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification so you don't miss an upload. And I'll see you in the next video. <laughs>